plow on through this and get some of this out of the way. Okay, I did mention before um, this whole idea of the microphone axis, which is the centre line or the imaginary line that's drawn through the centre of the microphone, and that is known as the microphone's axis, and we talk about things being on axis to the source or off axis to the source. And you would have seen it in the video about what happens when a sound uh, strikes a microphone from off axis and you not only get uh, if it's a directional mic uh, rejection from the pickup pattern overall but you also get a frequency relationship to that because directional microphones are more directional at high frequencies than they are at low frequencies so it means when you tilt a mic and you put it off axis to the source then you're going to be attenuating those high and mid frequencies and that is used strategically sometimes I gave the example of the live show where you see the person micing up a guitar amp and like in this diagram on here it's at an angle to the speaker and not going straight into it uh, there are some recording techniques which are kind of cool for recording things like guitars where people will put two identical microphones in front of the speaker and they'll have one that's slightly angled and one that's going straight ahead so they're getting both an off-axis and an on-axis perspective from the same microphone like a, a, a Shure SM57 and in fact there are commercial microphone mounts available with two clips that position them like that so you, you can put them on one stand and you can put two SM57s or whatever into that clip and you can have one that's going straight into the speaker and one that's going at an angle and then you've got two channels record enabled and you're hearing a, an on-axis sound and an off-axis sound side by side and you can blend between those two sounds when you're shaping your guitar sound or you can prefer one over the other depending on what's coming out of the amp and, and what sort of a sound you're after. So the, the concept of on-axis and off-axis is really important and then obviously the other parameter you have is the distance from the source which is important. So if we think about the behaviour of sound in a room in relation to the source and the listener, even just taking microphones out of the equation, this would be a concert hall scenario. So we have the direct sound on stage to the listener, that blue line, that is the shortest path that is being taken from the sound source to the listener and that is known as obviously the direct sound. And then at the same time, we have the other pathways, which are reflections from the room boundaries or from surfaces that are in the room. So in any listening situation where you've got a sound source and a listener, then you do have both the direct sound, which is going that shortest pathway, as I say, from the source to the listener. And then you're also getting reflected sounds, which is off all the room boundaries and the surfaces in that space, which are also longer. So the pathway of a reflected sound, you know, it's got to travel a, a longer distance before it reaches to the listener. And so therefore the reflections happen later in time. Okay, so the, the quickest thing to get to you is the direct sound uh, and it's followed by the room reflections which will, or reflected sounds which will come further down the line. Those two concepts are really important because we, we use them with, with microphones and we'll get to that in a minute. Reflected sound loses a bit of energy uh, when it hits a source um, and the amount of energy that it loses is dependent upon the nature of the surfaces that it's hitting. So obviously if a sound is hitting a hard surface, you know, if it's hitting concrete or if it's hitting glass or if it's hitting something that's very acoustically reflective, it's losing minimal energy before it gets passed on. It is losing some energy but it's, it's less than if it was say hitting an absorbative surface like a dense thick material foam or carpet and furniture and stuff in the room that is not hard that is absorptive in nature so obviously if sound is striking those sorts of materials it loses a lot more energy before it comes back out again and the amount of energy that it loses is called the absorption coefficient so when people speak about you know designing room acoustics they well, they have absorbers in there and their job is to absorb sound energy from the room and then each of those absorbers has a coefficient and the coefficient is the amount of energy or the amount of sound that it actually absorbs before it reflects on and that absorption coefficient is not even at all frequencies so just like polar patterns on microphones it's the same deal a given material of any kind has an absorption coefficient which will tell you how much it absorbs across each frequency. So some materials will readily absorb high frequencies but will not 
absorb low frequencies. So for example, carpet is a great example. If you had thick carpet on a wall, it's only really going to attenuate high frequencies. It does very little about lower frequencies. In order to absorb lower frequencies, you need a much denser material that's thicker than something like carpet. So, you know, once we start to try and absorb lower frequencies, we need very different materials to be able to absorb them than higher frequencies. So the reflected sound is also shaped in various ways by the material that it hits. It either gets darker or it gets or it remains relatively bright. So if I was in a stone room or a room with a lot of glass, then those materials, they're not absorptive, they're highly reflective. So we would expect that the reflection characteristic or the reverberation characteristic is going to be bright. Whereas if I was in a room with a lot of carpet in it, then I would expect that the reverberation characteristic would be much duller. It would still have reflection in lower frequencies, which could actually be quite substantial, but the high frequencies will get a bit sucked out by the, the, the carpet material. So the important concepts then about this is that we've got these two pathways to the listener. We've got the direct sound and we've got the reflected sound, and the reflected sound arrives later. Uh, and it becomes a reverberation, but also that, that the reverberation characteristic is shaped by the absorbers or the absorption of the materials that are in that room, you know, on the walls, floor, or any other objects that are in the room. So that's a pretty important concept. You know, when you look at studio design, for example, and you look at the, the, the different live rooms that they might have in a high-end studio, you will see acoustic panels whose sole purpose is to absorb sound. It might be that they want to contain bass, for example, to stop it from getting out of control and building up in the room. So they'll have bass absorbers and then they'll have other absorbers that are more directed towards high frequencies. So that's just to, to, to kind of tame the reverberation time in general to make sure it's capturing those higher frequencies. So you see that uh, in practice when you walk into a recording studio and you see the acoustic treatment that's around you. I'm, I won't go into that in detail now, but just making that connection between the two concepts. All right, so when we look at it in the time domain on the left-hand side, we can see the direct signal in red here. Okay, that's the thing that arrives first and it's obviously the loudest because it's not bouncing off anything. And then you have the first reflections uh, which are the first boundaries that it hits and they come to your ears next and then you have the later reflections where you're getting second and third bounces. And so you can see this sort of tail here, you know, which is your reverberation tail, it's the reflections all coming together and you can see that they're spread out over time between each of the reflections but also the overall time it takes for the reflections to stop. So you have the direct signal, you have the early reflections from those first surfaces and then you have the further bouncing around and that becomes your reverberation tail and as sound bounces around the room a little bit is absorbed each time and then eventually that reverberation tail um, goes away to nothing and the sound completely disappears <clears throat> so that becomes your reverberation time and there's a technical term for that which is called RT60 which is typically the way that reverberation time in a room is expressed. The reverberation time RT60, that's the time it takes to decay by 60 decibels relative to the, the impulse or the first sound. Uh, and you can see here that, you know, different acoustic spaces are designed around different reverberation times around what's considered to be desirable. So you can see there in this right-hand side, recording studios are typically between 0 0.4 and 0 0.8 um, seconds for their RT60. But then you go up to churches and auditoriums and they are based around longer reverb times. So, you know, a concert hall typically has a, a long reverb time because essentially, you know, when orchestras play, it's the way that concert halls have always been designed that the sound of the room reverberation is part of the sound of the orchestra. You know, you, if you imagine if you went in and tried to listen to a symphony orchestra in a dead, dry space, it would sound pretty terrible, right? So historically, and going right back, the kind of concert halls were designed to have longer reverb time. So it's, it's effectively like putting reverb wash across the, the orchestra. So the spaces are actually designed for what's going on in them, and concert halls are designed for the kind of reverberation characteristic that suits orchestras and chamber music really well. Whereas when we're recording in a recording studio, particularly in control rooms and things, we do not want long reverberation times because we're 
trying to mix and we're trying to focus on the acoustic spaces that we are creating in the loudspeakers and not have the the whole room that we're in at the moment adding to the perceptions of how much reverb or reflection is in our recording. So recording studios tend to be down the other end of the spectrum where the reverberation times are much shorter but also you will find in very in really high-end recording studios where they can afford to have a few different live rooms attached to the control room that typically those live rooms will have different acoustic properties so people are using the acoustic properties of the space as part of the recording if you want to look at this historically and music production A really great example is, say, looking into the 1980s. Most of you know that in, like, 80s music, the drum sounds are really big and explosive and all of that sort of stuff. That came about because in London at the time, in a couple of the big studios, there was a studio called Townhouse Studios that actually had a room made out of, fully out of stone, and that was called the Stone Room at Townhouse. You can look it up on the web and read about it. But that's where people used to record drums. So a lot of these huge drums from those 80s classic records with the massive exploding drum sounds were not created with artificial reverb units or processes or anything. The, the way that those drums were done was that the, the kits were set up in the Stone Room at Townhouse and then ambient mics were put up at a distance from that kit to capture all the room reflection. Uh, And because uh, cymbals tend to get extremely aggressive in that sort of environment, they would take the cymbals off the kit and just record the drums in that environment and then go back and then do the cymbals as a separate pass. And that would give you this highly explosive live room drum sound, which became a signature sound of all of that 80s production with the with the snares. I'll, I'll put up a playlist for you on Spotify with some good examples and I'll link it off the iLearn, but you can actually have a, have a listen to that. So that gives you an example of how the room acoustics and stuff start to play a role in music production. Uh, it's not always just about the plugins. It's not always about simulation, although I think we're getting to a stage now with digital signal processing and plugins where a lot of that stuff can be remarkably well uh, modelled and simulated digitally. So these traditional recording techniques in some ways are giving way a little bit to the digital models. So for example, UAD, Universal Audio Plugins, they have a model of Ocean Way Studios in Los Angeles. So you can get your drum kit or whatever it is and you can put it into Ocean Way Studios and you can play with the distance of the microphones from the source and you can impose the acoustic characteristic of Ocean Way on your recording. I could do it from a lounge room here. So we're getting a long way down that track of actually being able to model and emulate room acoustics for the purposes of trying to model the kinds of recording techniques which were largely done in the past by microphone placement and microphone setups. So it's a pretty interesting time. So as I mentioned before, the thing about the reverberation time is that it is not even across all frequencies. And I I spoke to that earlier because of the reflective properties of the materials in the room Some things will take out more high end, some things will take out more low end. And so what you tend to have then is a a reverberation characteristic, which is not just time based, but it is also frequency based. Okay, so your room reflections exhibit a, a frequency profile as well as a time profile. And that's pretty important because when it comes to Let's say, for example, designing recording studios is a really classic case in point, okay? So let's look at it from both sides, from recording and from also from being in the control room. So let's talk about the live room first. So if I had a recording room, a live room in a recording studio that had a very prominent set of peaks around particular frequencies in the reverberation tail, and I was recording a lot with the microphones further away from the sound sources then what i would find after i'd overdubbed about five six seven or eight things is that that resonant frequency of that room is going to is going to build up across all my tracks and so i'm going to get this sort of 
unhelpful build-up within a certain frequency range, which is essentially the sound of the room reflection, um, and it's building up across all of my tracks as I keep recording through that room. So when it comes to the acoustic design of recording spaces, the desirable outcome there for a recording space is to have this reverberation time be fairly well distributed and not exhibit any kind of really big peaks anywhere in the spectrum because if it gets peaking in the spectrum then you really have to be very selective and not have too much distance in your microphones or you're going to get that build up across all of your tracks and that's before you've even EQ'd anything or even mixed anything you're going to get a shaping effect of that room across all of your tracks so you need to be mindful of this idea that look reverberation and room reflection is really great and it can be used to to tremendous effect in recording by putting microphones further away from things but but when you do that you have to be aware of this which is that you are going to get some build up if you're doing it repeatedly and that build up could potentially problematic for this reason uh, my recommendation and it's pretty much what everyone does when they record is um, if you're interested in using room reflections as part of your sound don't just have a distant mic also take it close so if i was recording let's say a guitar and i want it was interested in using like the sound of my room here which is actually not too bad sounding it's got quite a nice you know it's got timber floors it's you know it, it sounds pretty nice in some ways if i was interested in that room sound I wouldn't just put a microphone and be getting a lot of room in the sound. I would put two mics up. I would put one that was close and had very little of this stuff going on in it, so it was very direct. And then I would have a second microphone that was further away that was just getting um, more of my room. Okay, so then I wouldn't be in that problem of later on, I've done like four guitar overdubs with the mic in the same position, and I'm going, oh man, it just sounds really roomy, or it's got low mid build up or something, and it's in, I'm trying to EQ it all out. So the principle is, is that you, if you know this is what's going on, then when you do get into this idea of trying out using mics that are a little bit further away from the sound source, then it's really important that you have something in close at the same time that you're able to use or balance with the more distant perspective. So that's a, it's a hot tip. It's not just a hot tip, it's just what everyone does. Um, you won't find anyone just putting microphones a long way away from something, well, very rarely unless they're after a special effect or unless they're recording like just a two track pass with no overdubs like a you know a chamber group or a, an orchestra and they're not going back over and over again and overdubbing you'll never see people just have distant mics and nothing in close okay so that's kind of important there are analyzer pieces of software um, in fact you can download some as demos i'll see if i can put them on the um, iLearn site but this is a time and frequency plot of a room response and so what you basically see on that left to right axis is frequency from 20 hertz. Well, this is just only going up to 500 hertz, so it's just looking at low end, this particular plot. And then from the back to front closest to us, you've got time up to 500 milliseconds. So you can see in this example, if you look over at 40 hertz on it, so find the 40 figure and then follow it through the time domain, that this analysis of this room shows you that 40 hertz takes 350 milliseconds to decay in the reverb tail. Whereas if you look up in the high frequency, well, it's not, it's not high, it's still low frequencies, this would be low mids, you know, up to 500 hertz, you see that it falls away much more quickly. So this is a room in which very low frequencies like 40 hertz will, will resonate and it might be that there are two parallel surfaces that are the exact wavelength of 40 hertz apart and that sound is just bouncing backwards and forwards perfectly between those two surfaces and it just hangs around for longer. So when people look at the performance of rooms and they look at the reverb characteristic of a room, the time domain is like super important, not just the frequency domain. If you look at that plot, just a frequency domain without the time domain, you're only really seeing half of the picture of what's going on in that room. So your room's where you are right now. It's, it's going to look like this, right? Um, and you're, you're not going to have analysis software. I mean, you can get it for home, you know, whatever. You can do it. There's a uh, product called Road Measure, you know, the Australian mic manufacturer road makes a product called road measure i think it used to be called fuzz measure but they bought it out and it's called road measure now 
but you can get a license for that and there's a test sequence that you do and then you can look at your room in this way as well it's quite interesting it gives you this waterfall plot over time so let's just think about this in practice so that's the sort of theory of what's going on right so if we think about let's bring microphones into the equation uh, if that's what's going on in rooms and that's the behavior of sound in rooms let's think about how it relates to us using microphones so in this particular example just look at the left hand side for a minute to the guitar amp example if i have a guitar amp that's on a wooden floor and i am recording that guitar amp and that microphone is not right on top of the amp it's just backed off a little bit then not only will I be getting the direct sound from the loudspeaker going straight on into the microphone, I'm also going to get a first reflection off that floor. And you can see it demonstrated there. And that is going to play a part in the sound because that is basically a copy of the sound that is coming in behind that direct sound with a little bit of attenuation of certain frequencies depending on what the floor is made out of but it's coming in pretty strongly straight after that first mic. So it's something that we need to consider. And so you've got a, a copy of the sound in that first reflection at a very short time delay. So think of it as a, a copy of the original with a time delay. Looking on the right hand side, which is a lectern example of somebody speaking at a lectern. This is a classic one. You hear this all the time. Once I point this out, you'll probably recognize it <laughs> next time you see someone speaking in a lectern but you'll see there that you've got the direct sound of the person speaking into the mic and then you've also got this reflected bounce off the lectern surface or you know where i am now i'm speaking to you now i've got my desk in front of you you can't see it but you know my mic is just here um, there will be a bounce from my voice back into into this mic and if i was to change the height of my microphone i won't do it now because it'll get noisy but it would slightly change the sound so these reflections that are coming in these first reflections are always playing a role in the sound so in these two examples you've got a direct copy of the sound coming in very quickly after the originals coming in and those two sound sources the direct sound and the reflected sound interact which is all to say that it changes the sound and it changes the spectrum so this introduces the concept of phase and phase cancellation which is one of the most important concepts when you work with microphones in this example two sources arises from room reflection or surface reflection so you can get phase cancellation so you can get interactions between the direct sound and the reflected sound depending on how that microphone is positioned in relation to a source and then any reflective surfaces that are nearby Okay, so that's really important. When you're recording stuff at home and you've got your microphone up, have a look around you at the reflective surfaces and then maybe move the mic around a little bit and then have a listen. You know, like, it's really great. I mean, I find voice is awesome for this, right? Because it's so revealing. Do some test recordings. Put your mic somewhere in the room. Record 10 seconds. Move the mic somewhere else. Record 10 seconds. Move it somewhere else. Record 10 seconds and then get them up in Pro Tools and just compare between the three and see if you can hear any differences even if the distance that you're maintaining with the mic is exactly the same you may find that there are noticeable differences in the sound depending on where you are in relation to any of the reflective surfaces around you so it's good to get to know your room right so you know most people go oh, I like to do vocals just right here because it just seems to be sound good right there x marks the spot whereas if i do it further over there and it's near a window then i'm going to get a, a, a direct bounce back off that window and, and my vocal is going to start sounding a bit hollow so you need to be aware of reflections and the interactions between the two super important even with one mic as soon as you start using more than one mic all of this stuff starts to get even more involved so phase cancellation is a really important concept and it occurs when two signals are out of phase with each other, so time shifted, and then when they're out of phase with each other and they're combined together, which they are by default on a microphone because you can't separate out the reflection from the direct because it's all coming in on one source. If I was using more than one microphone, then yes, I can separate out the mic two from mic one. So it does also happen when you've got two microphones on a source that are physically separated. And so therefore there are time differences between 
the sound hitting mic one and mic two, okay? That's a similar idea, but instead of a mic and a surface, it's two mics. So phase cancellation can occur, and that introduces something called comb filtering, or you get dips at different frequencies where it just hollows out and you get little parts of the spectrum that are missing. For those of you that use guitar pedals, the sound of a flanger, if you put a flanger on and you don't have any sweep on and it just goes all metallic and tinny, that's basically just cancelling at one frequency. When you put the sweep on a flanger and it does that sort of jet engine effect, that's basically just sweeping a very small time delay around across the sound of a copy of itself and then it just cancels frequencies so it just sounds like a filter moving around. So you get a flanging effect um, when you've got this phase cancellation happening. Okay, so it comes from the reflections or two microphones that are spaced apart and they're picking up the same sound source. So think about it, if I'm recording a drum kit, you know, I might have I don't know, 14 microphones. If I was doing like a full studio recording of a drum kit, I might have 14 microphones. That means that there are 14 different path lengths between when I hit the snare and when it hits all the other mics, right? So I'm going to get some interaction between those mics. And so microphone placement becomes really important when you've got multiple mics and there are, and there are a range of principles and how-tos and guides that I will talk about that help you get these mics so that they're working together well rather than interfering with each other and actually causing a detriment to your sound okay so here's a little uh video we'll play this <laughs> 